All right. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you uh, for asking uh, Cheryl and I to come and talk to you this evening. And thank you to Fred for that very, very kind introduction. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking to uh, this group about three years ago. And at that time, I did a talk about bone health as it relates to men who are dealing with prostate cancer. And in spite of the fact that it was an incredibly fascinating talk, <laughs> I had maybe one or two questions afterwards about bone health, but most of the men who came up to talk to me afterwards asked, why did it take so long for me to get from when my family doctor told me there was a problem to when I was in a position to make a decision about my treatment? Uh, and uh, and that, I heard that three, four times that evening. And that really struck a chord with me. And so uh, what I want to tell you about tonight is some of the things that we in the genitourinary tumor group have done. Oh, sorry. So what I want to... Um, use the podium mic? Okay. So what I want to talk with you about tonight is some of the things that we in the genitourinary tumor group have done over the last few years to try to address that issue as well as some others. And I'm very pleased to have Cheryl here to uh, share uh, uh, with you what her role is in, is in this whole process because she is a, a key and very important part of why this works the way we want it to. Uh, so I'm going to talk... Um, <coughs> a little bit about uh, um, what's happening with screening in the province, uh, an ongoing issue of concern. I'm going to talk about some of our initiatives in trying to improve uh, access to care for patients. Uh, I'll talk about the new facilities that are being built at the uh, Rocky View Hospital. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our awareness and education efforts and uh, um, some about uh, res the research program, and then a bit about advocacy and fundraising. So screening. As I'm sure everybody in this room is aware, uh, PSA screening is still not covered by Alberta Health Services. Um, that's a frustration for those of us who deal with prostate cancer and certainly for the men who are affected by it. Uh, the Prostate Cancer Center has, um, uh, as well as advocating for patients with the uh, Alberta government to try and get the funding put into place, has um, uh, brought on board what we call the man van. Some of you may have seen or heard this, some advertising around it. And what this does is it goes around to various community events. We've partnered with Safeway and at a number of events that they've held over the last year or so. The van is parked at the event and any man over the age of 40 uh, who has not had a baseline PSA test done can come in and have that test done in the van. Uh, the tests are available pretty well immediately. You get the results before you go. Uh, and you can take that information back to your family doctor or primary care provider um, uh, to start the discussion about does something need to be done about this. It's uh, in, in many ways uh, a small thing, I think, in that it's certainly not addressing the problem for men across the province who I believe should have access to PSA screening, um, but it is uh, sort of the flagship of our, our efforts to uh, uh, address that problem with the Alberta government, and it's one we're very proud of. Um, it was a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of red tape uh, to work through to get this program off the ground. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about what we're doing to try and improve access to care for patients. And uh, a few of those things, uh, first and foremost, is that we now have uh, Cheryl Scott in her position as the coordinator, nurse coordinator for the genital urinary program. So genital urinary cancers include prostate cancer. They're cancers that affect any part of the genital urinary system. So the kidneys, ureter, bladder, prostate, uh, penis. Um, those cancers are looked after by urologists and by medical and radiation oncologists who work in that field. 
One of the challenges we've had in Calgary is that the cancer program is based at the cancer clinic, um, uh, uh, which is here at the Foothills Hospital. The urologists are out in the community uh, and work largely through the Rocky View, uh, but they all have independent offices. And while it's a, a group of people who, um, uh, who uh, it's often easy to get them to work together on certain things, if there isn't easy access to your colleagues uh, in terms of asking a question about a care, the care of a patient or raising the uh, question about a potential research project or funding for a new program, if you're not face to face with those individuals on a regular basis, that creates challenges. And so one of the biggest problems that we needed to address as a group was how do we pull this group of people together, all of whom are, are passionate and concerned about doing what they can do to look after their patients, but they're doing it in different parts of the city and everybody's incredibly busy and it's hard to find time to get everybody together to discuss these things. And one of the things that we learned from watching what has happened in the breast health program was how important it was to have one person with the background and understanding of what the issues are for this patient population to try and coordinate um, those activities. Um, I can do that to a certain degree in, uh, in dealing and relating to my medical colleagues, but Cheryl's in a bit of a unique position and she brings a lot of uh, expertise uh, and uh, a long-standing working relationship with the urologists that's helped to foster that. So I'd actually like to turn it over to Cheryl for a few minutes and ask her to uh, describe to you what her role is and maybe even a little bit about what we see, how we see that role developing over the next couple of years. Thank you, Dr. Ruther. Um, I'll just go back to a little bit about um, my history that um, Mr. Shields um, pointed out is that first of all I was an OR nurse that worked predominantly with urology at the Rocky View Hospital. Then in 1997 I joined the Tom Baker Cancer Center to work on the randomized um, study for cryo and radiation therapy with Dr. Donnelly. So actually the last time I was here was when Dr. Donnelly presented that study on the cryo radiation and it was pretty well a full house and one fella looked at another fella and said why are you here tonight and he says because she phoned me and told me I had to come well I didn't phone anybody and tell anybody they had to come tonight but I do happen to have uh, along with me some of the quality of life papers um, from that study that are just being published and stuff this fall so if anybody was on that study and is interested um, here they are Anyways, um, I worked in the research um, for um, quite, quite a few years and then approximately must be about 2006, I decided I'd go back and refresh my OR skills, connect with the urologist again because as Dr. Ruther says, when we work in the Tom Baker Cancer Center, we become distanced from the other aspects of urology care. So I felt if I went back and worked in the OR, I would reconnect with the urologist, I did that and also worked through the Prostate Cancer Institute in the initiation of the RAP2 education classes, which Dr. Ruther will talk about later in the presentation. So because of all this background and this connection with the urologists, with the radiation oncologists and medical oncologists, psychologists, and all the partners in care of the prostate patient, the Tom Baker felt that I might be a good fit um, to come in, in to this new role of GU coordinator. So basically, Dr. Ruther had a few ideas um, of how this role would be rolled out. Um, some of it would be to relieve some of his workload of um, triaging patients as they were referred into the Tom Baker Cancer Center. So that's what I do on a regular basis, is I take a look at all the referrals that are sent in from the urologists, general practitioners, or anything along that line. Um, for patients to be seen at the Tom Baker to determine whether they need to be seen by a radiation oncologist, a, a medical oncologist, perhaps seen a psychologist, whether there's something in their history that uh, 
Our psychosocial service um, would be of assistance, whether palliative care would be assistance at that time, and try and you know give everybody the heads up so we can try and see the patient in the most convenient way for the patient and try and fit as many of those professional visits into at one time. And in this role too, I'm finding that we're all becoming real good partners in care because of Dr. Ruther with the linkage to the urology community and because of my linkage with the urology community. And also not only that, but with their um, secretaries that work in the urology office and the nurses in the OR and everything. We're all part of the whole care team. So in triaging patients too, it allows us to um, converse with the offices that are referring in to try and get the proper reports or tests ordered uh, in a timely manner so it can be a more efficient visit. Some of the other avenues that I'm looking at um, in my role is I'm helping Dr. Ruther in our multidisciplinary um, GU tumor group rounds where we're now connecting um, to Lethbridge and um, the, some of the Rocky View Hospital for pathology reviews and in my triaging of patients I can identify patients also that might be um, worthy to bring up for discussion for a multidisciplinary team discussion to how to approach um, their care. One of the other things that I've started to look at in my role is how we give our LHRH injections. Um, since we are, have a contract with Sanofi, we have various different dosages of a three month, four month and six month. So as a group, we've taken a look at this now and are trying to move as much as possible to perhaps a four month and six month um, Elagard injection to try and do things a little bit more efficiently, save visits for patients to the cancer clinic, and um, just try and utilize our time at the center a little bit better. Um, one of the other things that I'm working with is the radiation oncologist to um, meet with them on a regular basis to develop standard protocols of care while patients are in having radiation therapy so that everybody is getting the, the same um, information at the proper time. How this role rolls out in the future, um, I don't know for sure, but whenever I go to a meeting and there's um, something to be done, I always hear, well, Cheryl can do that. Well, Cheryl can do that. So um, I think there's a bunch of different ideas how um, we will progress in the future. I think we can um, look at doing things more efficiently and perhaps ordering more tests in advance for patients coming into the Tom Baker Cancer Center. Um, I also offer a linkage between the RAP2 sessions for patients that have attended those and are transitioning into the Tom Baker Cancer Center. So hopefully this will grow in the future as well too. For any of those patients that are sitting there kind of wanting a little bit more information, knowing what information they should be reading, researching and everything as they transition into the Tom Baker. I'm doing a little bit of that now, but hopefully that will grow in the future as well too so that we can provide a better link of information and um, providers and stuff for patients. Um, what other things do you have in mind for me? <laughs> I don't want to tell you all of them. <laughs> so anyways, I'll let Dr. Ruther take over. And um, again, I've, it's one of the things that I've learned in, in taking on this coordinating role is how important it is to have the right people in the right position. And um, I could not have, um, I could not have asked for better and more qualified help than, than we have in Cheryl. So uh, she gets a lot of credit for helping to pull a group of pig-headed physicians along in, in uh, making this work better for patients. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about uh, a program that I'm very excited about, uh, what we call the Rapid Access Program. It's also a program that's in, in development um, and this is a, uh, this started um, about five, six years ago now, uh, recognition amongst the urologists that the process by which patients 
um, were referred from their family physician to a urologist and then the biopsy was organized if it was appropriate to pursue that the way the PSA testing was done that process um, depending on how uh, how the patient presented and how aggressive the family physician was in following up on it and pursuing the appointments that were needed for the patient could take months uh, and it was a source of a great deal of frustration so um, uh, Dr. Brian Donnelly uh, was the one who spearheaded the what we call the RAC1 program or the rapid access uh, one program and what that has done is created a process by which the 14 urologists who work in the city here cooperate. Um, they staff what we call the rapid access clinic on a weekly basis and they, they uh, have a rotational, um, uh, uh, their attendance at that clinic rotates. So if a family doctor out in the community sees a man and I, identifies an abnormality on rectal examination or that man has a PSA uh, test drawn and that test is worthy of further attention and that patient needs to be seen by a urologist to decide whether it's appropriate to pursue additional testing or a biopsy then that referral the we didn't want to interfere with the the nor the patterns of communication that exist out in the community GPs often have developed a working relationship with a certain urologist and have a have a uh, uh, confidence and trust in that one individual we didn't want to interfere with that so what we did is that the 14 urologists agreed that when these referrals came into their office, they would all go to a central point for review, and that is the rapid access clinic. And so um, that information is taken to the rapid access clinic, and then the urologist, whoever it happens to be that is in the clinic at that particular time, sees those patients. Uh, if necessary, uh, repeats a rectal exam to determine whether it's appropriate to do a biopsy. And then the rapid access clinic has the responsibility for setting up the appropriate biopsy and making sure that the patient has the um, uh, appropriate information to organize follow-up with the uh, urologist uh, who they were originally referred to. So, and our, our intention in setting this up was to get these timelines down. So from the time of the patient being identified to have a problem by their family physician to when they're seen in the rapid access clinic, we wanted that down to two weeks or less. From the point of contact in the rapid access clinic where they were assessed and it was determined that it was necessary that a biopsy be done, we wanted to get that down to two weeks or less. And then if a patient has a biopsy and needs to follow up with their urologist to hear about those results, we wanted to get that down to two weeks as well. So we were trying to shorten a process which for many patients up to that point in time had taken months down to a period of about six weeks. And, um, uh, and it is to the credit of my colleagues in urology who have all cooperated in this that that part of our program works extremely well now. And the vast majority of patients who are referred through the rapid access program and go on to biopsy are back to see their, their urologist within six weeks to begin the discussion about what is this biopsy showing us and what do we have to do now. Um, and that, so that has been a real success and I know of no other place in Canada that has developed something similar to that to try and facilitate this part of the process for patients. Um, I came into this uh, with what we call RAC2 <coughs> and again Having heard from many patients over the years, you know, it, it took so long, why did it take so long for me to get from seeing my family doctor to hearing the information I needed to being able to make a decision, uh, a process that could take months. The other thing that is, I think, uh, uh, both a frustration and an opportunity for patients with prostate cancer is that unlike other situations in cancer where it's often very clear that there's one set of things that need to happen in terms of an operation, chemotherapy potentially, radiation treatment. As a, I'll use breast cancer as an example. A woman facing that kind of treatment doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of choices in terms of different options to look at. She can choose to take the treatment or not. For men with localized prostate cancer, there are a number of different options for localized treatment. And to the best of our ability to compare those treatments, 
and say which of these is better, as long as patients are appropriately directed to the right choices, the, the potential to control and manage the cancer is equally effective. And so that creates a situation for patients where they have the luxury of choice, but it also a, a, creates a problem, a situation of high anxiety where a man and his family have just learned about the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Now they have to decide, do I want an operation? Do I want to go for external beam radiation? What about brachytherapy? What is cryotherapy? What's HIFU? There's all this information that you're bombarded with. And I felt it was very important that we do things to try and improve how we educate patients. We know too from looking at the medical literature that if a patient is referred to a urologist and hears about the treatments for prostate cancer from a urologist, they're more likely to choose surgery over the other options. If a patient sees a radiation oncologist first, they're more likely to choose radiation. And that to me is not necessarily a bad thing. What it says is the people who do these things are enthusiastic about what they do and they believe in what they do. But I think it does demonstrate that we can introduce biases intentionally or not in relaying information to patients that maybe don't maybe aren't in their best interest and if we really want to do the best we can to look after patients we need to provide them with the information about these options and we need to support them as they make a decision with their health care provider um, uh, and so that's what the the uh, rapid access uh, education session about so this this diagram describes Oh, I don't know what happened there. The RAC1 process, um, and along the side there, it's supposed to say two weeks. So as you can see, a GP identifies an abnormal rectal exam or PSA and refers to their urologist of choice. That urologist takes that information to the rapid access clinic, and the intention is that that first uh, uh, set of blocks, that time span is down to two weeks. From the time they are, uh, from the time they're referred and seen in their rapid access clinic, uh, down to two weeks. From the time they're seen in rapid access to the to having their biopsy done, we wanted that under two weeks, and then they're seen back by the urologist who they were referred to to begin the discussion about the results of the biopsy. So that's what we call rapid access phase one. So as I said, a referral process and clinic established with the support of the 14 urologists. It occurs on a weekly basis at the prostate cancer, I should say center now, uh, no longer called the institute. It runs over one or two days, depending on what the need is that week. Um, and the urologists attend that on a rotational basis. So the next step, as far as I was concerned, the next step was what do we do to facilitate the education of our patients so that they can make the choices they need to make. And, um, and the traditional way of dealing with this was for a patient to see a urologist and hear about the surgery, come to the cancer clinic to hear about external beam radiation. But if you wanted to learn about brachytherapy, you had to make sure you saw a radiation oncologist who did brachytherapy, and it's not necessarily the same as the one who does external beam treatment. If you wanted to learn about cryotherapy, you need to talk to another individual. So a patient could take months navigating all of these appointments um, and trying to collect all of that information to make an informed decision. So what we did was we set up this education program. So this occurs every two weeks at the Prostate Cancer Center on Wednesdays from 5 to 7. The patients, uh, only patients who have been newly diagnosed with prostate cancer can attend the session. And they're referred to the program by their, by their urologist. So most of the patients who've come to the session have had the results of their biopsy given to them either because they've been back into the urologist's office to hear about it or they've had a phone call and said the biopsy is positive we're going to set you up to attend this education session. Um, the, uh, the session is attended by myself from medical oncology, a radiation oncologist and a urologist and, um, and then uh, the appropriate support from nursing as well. Um, and the intention is to present patients with some background information about the prostate gland and prostate cancer and then an opportunity for them to hear from the local experts about all of these treatment options. And it does uh, a few things um, which I think have been very helpful. Number one, 
It's put the physicians involved in the care of these patients in a set of circumstances where they have to interact with one another on a, on a face-to-face basis. And um, you have to be respectful of your colleagues. You have to be very clear that everybody's agreed about what the information is that you're presenting here. And that process was a lengthy one. Um, but we've all reviewed all of this information and decided, yes, this is what we're comfortable with, this is appropriate. And, um, and so there's a, it's, uh, my hope is that this is a balanced presentation of the different treatment options. Um, uh, it provides us with some other opportunities as well. It gives us the opportunity to present patients with the potential option to participate in clinical research trials. We have created a database attached to these education sessions and what I'm hoping that will allow us to do is over time track the appointments as patients move through the system so we can be sure that we're meeting our targets in terms of getting people through in a timely fashion. And we've been doing these sessions for uh, two years now. We started in October of 2007 and have put over 500 men and uh, it's very unusual for a man to attend the session on his own. Usually has a spouse or a family member uh, with him. Uh, and it's, I think, been very successful, but certainly been very well received by the, by the patients who have um, been through the education sessions. Um, and I think it's created a whole bunch of benefits for us uh, other than the primary uh, objective, which was to improve access and education for our patients. But it's, it's created an environment of, of uh, collaboration and cooperation between urology, radiation, and medical oncology. Um, it's, it's strengthened the links that we needed between the physicians who are in the community and the physicians who are in the cancer program. Uh, it has helped us with our wait times. Um, um, we've uh, been able to demonstrate that, that our waiting times to get into certain visits is shortened, perhaps because we're directing patients a little more effectively ahead of time to the right care providers. And as I said, I'm hoping that the database we're creating will help us to track patients as they move through the system and allows us to keep our eye on the, on the targets that are important. And as I said, an opportunity to talk to patients about the possibility of, of participation in our clinical research trials. So RAC3 is a concept um, uh, and what this is what we're working towards. Um, there are new facilities being built at the Rocky View Hospital and it is my hope that over the next couple of years we can work towards the creation of a truly multidisciplinary clinic. So the next step after a patient attends the education session to me would be a booking in the clinic with appropriate with time set up for the uh, patient to meet with the appropriate consultants. If you need to speak to a urologist we can arrange that appointment to happen. If it's a radiation oncologist or uh, the person who does cryotherapy that you need to speak to, we can make that happen, potentially even two or three of those visits in one, uh, one visit to the program. Um, so again, I think a, a logical step in trying to improve how patients access information, but an opportunity for us to create a collaborative environment um, for all of the physicians and care providers who are involved that'll help to move the agenda forward both in terms of how we care for patients on a day-to-day -day basis, but in allowing us to ask research questions and contribute to education, both of patients and of, uh, of physician trainees. So that's, that's RAC3, that's my dream. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm confident, although our present healthcare environment creates some skepticism, I think we will be able to get there. Um, the other program that I want to tell you about is what we call the wellness program. So this is another education session that we hold at the Prostate Cancer Center and I believe uh, that we have some of the uh, pamphlets here tonight uh, to share with people. Um, and this is available to any patient who has been treated for prostate cancer at any time after their treatment. So maybe six months, a year, five years, ten years down the road. Patients can refer themselves into this session. You call the Prostate Cancer Center to register. Um, it's held, um, remind me now, Tuesday? Last Tuesday of every month, not in July and August, 
but uh, every other month of the year. And the, that session is attended by um, uh, people who work in the psychosocial program uh, at the Tom Baker. There's a dietitian. We have a physiotherapist and a kinesiologist. Um, and those individuals are there to help address uh, the concerns that are common for patients who have been treated for prostate cancer. Issues related to sexual health and intimacy. Uh, problems related to uh, continence and bladder control. Um, we often are asked uh, by patients once they learn about a diagnosis of prostate cancer, are there other things that I can do to help myself? And one of the things that people, common, people commonly look at is diet. Uh, and dietary interventions. So we've tried to set up this program again with the intention of meeting the, the needs of the patient who have been through treatment. And as I said, it's open to any patient who's dealing with the diagnosis, has dealt with prostate cancer and, and treatment. And you simply call the Prostate Cancer Center to uh, register. Before I move on, are there any questions about what you've heard so far. I'm interested in your numbers there at the RAC2 stage uh, where you said in the last two years you've had 500. Uh, yeah. What percentage of uh, diagnosed uh, patients would that uh, be over the last two years? I, I don't know if I, I, I can't tell you what percentage of men that would be who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. It, it would be the majority who've come through. Um, there, are, there are some patients who are offered the opportunity to come to the session and choose not to. It's not the way they want to get information. It is, a, it is a, in a sense, a public forum, so we have a room set up where uh, it's not a one-on-one -on -one thing that's occurring between the patient and the providers, and that makes some patients uncomfortable. Um, but uh, um, I, I couldn't tell you what percentage it is, but it's it's a high number and it's increasing because we've seen the referrals to the RAC2 program in, increase over the last two years. It's pretty, uh, we, we pretty much fill the room up every two weeks. We have as few as seven and as many as 12 patients at each session. Um, so. so could you, uh, again, just uh, looking at numbers, you don't, uh, uh, you don't have a uh, number of how many men are diagnosed standardly here? I, I should, but I don't. Can't tell you what it is. I'm sure the urologists would be able to tell us. But yeah. I'd estimate it's double. Sorry. From the numbers I've seen, I'd estimate it's probably closer to double. Might be. Yeah. There's another question at the back. In your presentation on the RAC2, you said that the first step was patients who have been diagnosed. Yeah. So I'm assuming, and that's a bad word, that you're talking about patients who have tested positive on the biopsy. That's right. Only patients who have a diagnosis of prostate cancer are eligible to attend this session. So one of the things I've learned over the years is that there are some things that can be done to decide whether the cancer is still contained within the prostate or it has spread. Uh, no, no. The intention, this is not intended to in any way to replace or supplant what happens when a patient sits down and talks to their individual physician. And, and um, uh, so I want to be very clear that the intention of this program is to provide some general background information so that when patients sit down and talk with their urologist or their radiation oncologist, it's our hope that having that background information will allow them to engage in a more helpful and meaningful discussion for them as they talk about the individual issues around their case. We do not discuss patient-specific information in this session. So the patients who attend have a, uh, a, a piece of paper that provides them with all of their individual information, but that's not information that is shared in the context of the session. The back. Yeah. Um, did you say you were going to be something more similar to what they do with breast cancer? No, no. What I, what I said earlier, I think, was that um, in the breast health program, 
there is a nurse coordinator and that she has functioned in that role for a couple of years now. And we've seen the benefits of that in terms of moving patients through the system where, where breast cancer is concerned. And it was part of, what, part of the impetus for us to develop a similar role within the GU program. Because I went through prostate cancer in 2008. My wife went through breast cancer in 2009. And mm -hmm. it was like the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I went through the information session. We said, well, come, come back and tell us what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And the, the breast cancer, I know it's different. They, they came to a whole bunch of different programs. Yeah. 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 We still have a lot to learn. I'll come back to that. I just think further to this comment, you have patient navigators who help someone who's just struggling with it? Not yet. And I understood Elder does have patient navigators. The breast program does. There's a patient navigator so attached, attached, to one particular. attached to each of the main hospitals. There's a, a breast health program navigator. But not for other diseases that people have made. No. Said we still have a lot of work to do. Well, this was three years ago. So we've done a lot of work Any other questions before we, we move on? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about the, the new facilities. Um, so the Urology Center is new space that's being constructed right now at the Rocky View. Uh, if any of you have driven by there, you'll notice the big parkade at the front and there is office space going on the top of that parkade. There's about 40,000 square feet of space there. A little over half of that is designated uh, for the new urology center. Uh, what this will do um, is put an, and scheduled occupancy for March of 2010. Um, I keep hearing that that's still on target. What that will do um, is create the hub that I think is going to be very important in moving the whole agenda around multidisciplinary clinics forward. So all of the urologists in the city will have their offices in that facility. The facility is set up so that minor surgical procedures can be carried out there. So if a man needs to come in and have a, excuse me, a catheter removed or some stitches removed after having had surgery, it can be done uh, there. Um, there is office space designated there, office and clinic space designated there for use by medical and radiation oncology. So although we are primarily attached to the cancer clinic here, we will be going down there. Um, haven't figured out the logistics of that yet, whether it's going to be a rotational basis or how it will work. But the intention is to put radiation and medical oncology next to urology in the clinics. So when a patient is booked in to see a consultant, we can look at that ahead of time and say this person needs to see both the urologist and the radiation oncologist, or this is a patient who we should be talking to about uh, this particular clinical trial, and so we can arrange for them to see the urologist and the medical oncologist. Um, uh, so that, that's, this is the hope for the, uh, for the new facilities. Um, it will uh, provide that space for it. There is uh, for us. There is going to be uh, the Prostate Cancer Center, which is now 
housed down off of Glenmore Trail will be housed in this facility as well. And um, in attempts to create stronger links with our partners out in the community in Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, some surrounding areas where they don't have access to all of the uh, same um, level of service, uh, we're hoping to create video links, for example, for our RAC2 education program so that patients in Lethbridge who are newly diagnosed can sit in on the discussion and, uh, and uh, hopefully in doing that we can facilitate the information exchange that's needed and help to build some of the links that are needed to, to make referrals happen the way they need to. Um, we, I'm not sure what's happening with the uh, research lab space. There has been talk about creating space within that facility uh, for a research lab for um, one individual who I'll mention a little farther on. And I'm not sure where those discussions are at yet. But again, if you put that space in an area where the clinicians are working, it fosters the important communication that needs to happen between the basic researchers and the clinicians in answering research questions and, and contributing to education, I believe. Um, we're also developing new facilities in association with the cancer program, so you may have heard the term the radiation therapy corridor. Um, right now, if you are looking at radiation treatment for any type of cancer in Alberta, that has to be done in Calgary or Edmonton. Um, there are facilities being built in Lethbridge right now, uh, and those are supposed to open and start seeing their first patients in April of 2010. It will not provide all of the same level of service that's available at the radiation facilities in Calgary and Edmonton, but at least, at least will provide patients in those communities with um, access to the, some of the basic radiation treatments. And that will help us. Uh, obviously, we want to make those treatments available for patients anywhere in Alberta. doesn't matter where in Alberta you are, you should have access to all of the same types of care. Um, but being able to treat those patients closer to home in their own community obviously is advantageous for them and creates uh, um, potential uh, options for us in terms of dealing with our waiting lists because all of those patients come to us right now. So hopefully Lethbridge will be open in April of 2010. The plans as of about a year ago were that Red Deer would open a year after that and Grand Prairie two years after. Um, some of those timelines are probably altered based on the restructuring that's going on with Alberta Health Services right now. But it is still the intention to open radiation treatment facilities in these three sites uh, over the next few years. Um, so awareness and education. Um, a lot of credit has to go to the Prostate Cancer Center locally for the work that they do in raising awareness and contributing to education programs. You've probably all seen the ads in magazines and on TV about the Get Checked program. Um, uh, I talked to you earlier about the Man Van uh, and that's uh, a, a program sponsored and operated by the Prostate Cancer Center um, and they've had to go out and raise the money to buy the van, buy the equipment to uh, do the uh, rapid PSA testing. The van has to be staffed with nursing support when, it's, uh, when the PSA testing is being offered. And so, again, uh, I just kudos to my colleagues at the Prostate Cancer Center for the great work that they've done. I um, want to tell you a little bit about Neanderthal November. Um, you may have heard of a program called uh, Movember. Uh, hasn't caught on as well as uh, uh, Prostate Cancer Canada might have hoped. Um, uh, and it was uh, during the month of November, uh, don't shave, uh, grow a mustache, and uh, raise funds in support of prostate cancer uh, research and education. And so the Prostate Cancer Center's taken it one step forward, and, and um, uh, so this year, for the first time, we're going to do what's called Neanderthal November. Uh, you can get a pledge form. Um, pack your razor away for the month and see how much money you can raise over the course of the month. Um, actually, And then uh, I'll tell you about um, another program uh, that we have running uh, on October the 25th this year. Um, 
just to back up a little bit and give you some background, Positively Pink was or has been an education and awareness event that was organized by one of my colleagues in the breast health program, Dr. Barb Wally, uh, who is the director of the breast health program um, here in Calgary. Uh, a few years ago, uh, recognized that, that a lot of patients um, uh, and a lot of members of the public uh, make a, uh, an incredible effort every year in participating in weekend walks and the CIBC Run for the Cure and uh, so there, there's a, there are a lot of things that happen to raise money for research and education in breast cancer and she felt very strongly that um, w she wanted to do something to give back to that community uh, to, to say thank you for the, for the effort. And so her thought was to do some sort of education and awareness event around breast cancer. And that was called, uh, has been called Positively Pink. Um, so that's an event that's occurred yearly for the last three years in October. Uh, it's been an opportunity for uh, the public and patients affected by breast cancer and their families to come and hear from the local experts about what's happening that's new in treatment, education, research. We've had guest speakers come in from, uh, from outside and it's been, uh, I think again, a, a very well received and, and uh, positive experience for people who have uh, attended this. I've worked in both the, the GU and the breast program for 15 years now and there are a lot of similarities between prostate cancer and breast cancer. Um, uh, and I think the other thing that's very important is that breast cancer has, uh, and, and women affected by breast cancer have really sort of led the charge when it comes to advocacy and awareness for cancer patients. So when you raise issues about the fact that there are health, uh, breast health navigators, you know, at the three hospitals in the city, when you look at the amount of money that is, that is raised uh, all over the world to support breast cancer education and research programs, that, that comes from the fact that there was a grassroots movement started 25, 30 years ago amongst patients who said, we need to do something to make a difference here. And it's been incredibly successful. And men always take a little bit of time to get caught up you know 25 20 years later we're starting to say you know what they're doing some things right we need to pay attention to this we need to learn from their experience but we need to partner with them because they do this very well and so uh, when Barb approached me a year ago after we had done the last positively pink event and said what if we tried to do something for both breast and prostate cancer the two most common cancers affect men and women um, and, uh, but they, they not only affect the patient, they affect the family uh, in very similar ways. The issues that patients have to deal with in dealing with the effects of treatment following breast and prostate cancer treatment are very similar. And so there's a lot of common ground there that just, it makes sense to try and pull those two groups together. And again, when we see over the last few years, the increasing effort that's been made on the part of patients uh, advocating for themselves but doing things to raise awareness and raise funds in support of prostate cancer education and research the opportunity was there for us to give back and say thank you for your efforts so pink plus blue is purple I won't defend it wasn't my choice but that's what it's called <laughs> um, and so it will be at the TELUS Convention Center on October the 25th uh, for patients with breast and prostate cancer but it's open to the general public um, and the intention is for this to be an awareness and educational event uh, for the patients and the public and and as I said you'll hear from local experts within the GU and breast programs about what's happening in Calgary both in terms of our 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 day-to-day -day care of patients but also about research and education uh, and we have some of the bookmarks here that give you the information about Positively Purple where you can go to go onto the website to um, um, purchase tickets. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about what we're doing locally as far as research is concerned. Um, 
These names uh, are uh, certainly not an exhaustive list, but some of the newer names on, on, the, uh, uh, on the playground over the last year or so. Dr. Tarek Bismar is a uh, genitourinary pathologist, but also a world-renowned uh, researcher in prostate cancer, and we were very fortunate to be able to recruit him about a year ago, a little more than a year ago now actually, um, maybe closer to two years. And I'm pleased to say that uh, many of you may be aware of what's called the Motorcycle Ride for Dad, uh, another event that I'll talk about. Money that was raised through the Motorcycle Ride for Dad in Calgary has been used to fund Dr. Bismar's research lab. Uh, and that's happened for the last three years. So the effort that patients are making locally is making a difference locally in terms of providing the facilities for people like Dr. Bismar to do his research. Dr. Bernie Eigel is one of my colleagues in medical oncology. Um, he is a, a, GU a GU oncologist who did uh, additional training uh, in uh, uh, genitourinary cancer and prostate cancer. And he's taken on the daunting task of becoming the provincial director for our uh, research program within the cancer program. One of the challenges we've had in, in cancer research in Alberta is that um, the funding for that program is all what we call soft funding. So the Alberta Cancer Board did not commit on a yearly basis funds to support the research effort. We had to raise that money by bringing in the appropriate studies to pay the staff, to you know the clinical research nurses, the data coordinators, the effort that's involved in bringing these research trials on board is, is Herculean and very expensive. Um, and we've said for a long time, we're hamstrung. We can't go to the next level if we don't have um, uh, hard funding in place on an annual basis. Yes, we recognize that we need to support the research effort in, in raising money by other means, but there needs to be a commitment uh, to hard funding for our research program. And so Dr. Eigel has taken on the job of, of coordinating the effort provincially, but also lobbying um, uh, government to bring forward the hard funding to support the research program. A bit of a thankless task. Uh, Dr. Daniel Heng is our newest recruit in medical oncology. Um, also has done specialty training in uh, genitourinary oncology. His particular area of interest is in kidney cancer but he is a whiz with databases and what he's been able to do for us in developing the databases attached to some of these other programs is going to be very helpful for us over the coming years in answering important questions about how we provide care on a day-to-day -day basis and doing the quality assurance around that but it will also lend itself to answering important research questions. Um, and very recently Dr. Kawakami has joined us. He is a urologist who we were very fortunate to be able to recruit after the untimely passing of Dr. Ted Elliott, who some of you may know. He died suddenly uh, a few months ago and left a huge, huge uh, hole um, here in Calgary. He practiced here for a long time, uh, saw a lot of patients and uh, uh, was um, not, not somebody easily replaced. But we were very fortunate uh, in the few weeks following his death uh, to uh, be able to attract Dr. Kawakami, who is not only trained as a urologist, but also has done additional specialty training in, uh, in uh, GU oncology. And so what I want to show you here is that we are slowly bring, building the pieces, bringing on the right people to be able to move our research agenda forward. And, and make a contribution um, uh, not only for patients in Canada but around the world. <coughs> uh, and finally, advocacy and fundraising. Uh, so I mentioned the motorcycle ride for Dad earlier. Um, <coughs> we held our first rides in Calgary and Edmonton in June of 2007. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on this, this started in Ontario in 2000. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Charlie Pester who, was a, uh, who died of prostate cancer. And uh, a group of his friends, after he died, about 12, 14 guys decided, 
One day they were just going to go out and get on their bikes and go for a ride in memory of Charlie. And that was the first motorcycle ride for Dad. That was in, um, in Ottawa in 2000, and that was with 14 riders. In 2007, when we held our first ride in Calgary, they had had, by that time, seven rides in Ottawa, and they had 1,600 riders out at the last ride at the, at the 2007 ride and raised over a million dollars. And the, the wonderful thing about the motorcycle ride for Dad, and real credit goes to the organizers for this, the money that is raised in that city stays in that city to support the local programs. So what's raised in Ottawa has stayed in Ottawa to support patients there. What we've raised in Alberta through rides in Calgary and Edmonton has stayed here to support um, our efforts. And I mentioned earlier that some of that funding has been used to support Dr. Bismar's, uh, the development of Dr. Bismar's lab. Um, the Underwear Affair is an or as a, uh, event organized by the Alberta Cancer Foundation. The Alberta Cancer Foundation has held a very successful weekend walk to end breast cancer over the last several years and raised millions of dollars. Um, uh, but recognized that they, they wanted to be doing something for other types of cancer. And so the concept for the underwear affair uh, was brought forward and that was to raise money for cancers below the waist. So they held the first event in June of 2008, second one in June of 2009. And again, have successfully raised millions of dollars, which is earmarked for research programs in genital urinary cancers, colon cancer, gynecological cancers. So a researcher with a good idea for a program or wanting to ask a relevant question, can apply, and if it's within the arena of, of prostate cancer, can apply to the Alberta Cancer Foundation for access to the money that has been raised through the underwear affair. So again, important things happening locally that are doing a lot to bring money into our local programs, both in terms of providing day-to-day -day care but supporting research and education. Thank you. Well, we have time for a couple more questions before we move on. I think you said the early stage, you didn't want to disrupt the relationship between a family physician and his favorite urologist. Yeah. But I had the impression that if one attended that first phase, they might see a urologist who is not that. That's exactly right. And that was, that was part of the issue that needed to be dealt with. So the urologist that you see when you come to the Rapid Access Clinic 1 for assessment is likely not to be the urologist who got your primary referral. But when you go back to sit down with the urologist to talk about the results of your biopsy, it will be with the urologist to whom you were originally referred. Yeah. Um, if we move to the Rocky View, would we still keep our own oncologist? Yeah. Yes. Not, none of this. None of this will interfere with uh, with any patterns that are already in place in terms of how patients are referred. Um, it just it provides an opportunity for us to be doing clinics in a different area that's more closely located with the, to the urologists. And on a, on a lighter note, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the NHL are wearing mauve white ties. It's October week, October month, mm -hmm. and uh, if you look at all the sports presenters, they all have the same ties. That's a nice tie. Any other questions? Fred. You might as well stay down here, Fred, because you're on there. <laughs> Is that on now? Yeah. I'm sorry, Dean, but I've got three questions, and I'll be trying to be brief. <laughs> First, when I went to the uh, Tom Baker research website to find out what they are doing yeah. in urology, or rather than uh, prostate cancer, I find that it was last updated in 2008. Is there a, a, obviously staff shortages, etc. Uh, is there a move to correct that? 
I'm not sure it's so much staff shortages as all the reshuffling that's going on in Alberta Health Services right now. Um, and, and trying to figure out who owns that now, who's responsible for keeping it up to date. Um, I think that's the bigger question, Fred, than actually uh, uh, an inability to do it. It's whose responsibility is it now, now that the Alberta Cancer Board no longer exists? My, my next question is, in many centers, there are medical oncologists that deal with prostate cancer and prostate cancer alone. This enables them to keep on top of latest developments in a, in a, in a field, a single field as opposed to a broad uh, smattering of, of fields as no doubt you do. Does it make sense and, uh, to um, their logic to having fewer oncologists, medical oncologists, deal with prostate cancer and prostate cancer alone? Um, I, you, will, you will meet people who will argue both ways. Um, there is certainly uh, increasingly a, a tendency for oncologists to become further subspecialized. So within our group, for example, all of us work in one, two, maybe three tumor sites. So I do GU, breast, and endocrine. Um, um, others may do lung and GI. And there, there's an advantage to that degree of specialization. I'm, I'm a little hesitant about that because um, I think it's, it's easy to become so pigeonholed and so single-minded that you lose sight of the fact that cancer, there's a lot about prostate cancer that relates to and is similar to breast cancer and how we manage lung cancer impacts how we treat colon cancer. And so you need the right mix of people who really want to focus, uh, are passionate and want to focus on one area, but you also need people who have a bit of an overarching view and can say, but we have to do this in the context of how we care for all patients with cancer. Thank you. The third, third question has to do with a report that came out in the journal Nature. And it appears that the BC Cancer Agency, their genome science, the science center, uh, has done DNA sequencing. Yeah. Which um, seems to be able to um, diagnose what type of cancer a breast cancer patient has. Is there any, any move afoot to uh, do the same thing here, especially in prostate cancer? So um, I think it's a little bit of a, a, maybe a misunderstanding about what it is that the BC group has done. Um, what they've done is, is phenomenal and will do a great deal to move the agenda forward for patients with breast cancer, but for patients with other types of cancer as, as well. One of the questions we've always struggled with is, we, if we identify a cancer, we'll use breast cancer as an example, here in the breast, what is it about that cancer that a year, two years, five years later, that cancer is found in the bones or in the liver of that patient? And for another woman with breast cancer who's had that tumor removed, that problem never occurs. So what the BC group has done is they took a tumor, a primary tumor from a patient who had breast cancer, and then at some point later, when that woman unfortunately developed metastatic disease, they biopsied that site, and they've done the genomic sequencing on both of those, and they've been able to compare the differences. What, is the, what, is, what do the genetics look like in the tumor when it was found in the breast, and how does it differ in the tissue that we removed from the metastatic site. And so it's not, the same, it's not the same as saying that we can now do genetic sequencing for any patient with cancer. They've done this with, with two of these samples, and what that will do is allow them to do comparisons and, and say, this gene is active here in this metastatic deposit of cancer. It wasn't active here. Maybe that's an important signal that will help us to understand why cancer spreads, why this breast cancer spread. 
that will probably be information that's helpful for patients with all types of cancer because the signals are probably very common. We're a long way from being able to take a patient's sample and do the genetic sequencing on his entire or her entire piece of cancer to say that this is the type of cancer you have and this is how that's going to behave. Thank you. Okay. One more question, and I, and I get to ask it. Uh, you talked about the, uh, the man band. Yeah. Age 40 being the minimum age. Is yeah. there an upper age limit? Uh, no, there's not. Because somebody in this room, I don't know the gentleman is still here, uh, was turned away. Oh, really? Was late. Well, that's news to me. That's news to me. I have to get that clarified. Yeah. Uh, well, I talked to the gentleman. He, had, he is already being diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. Yeah. So he wasn't the first. So that's, that's the, the intention is if you have not had a PSA okay. test done and are 40 or over, then you're eligible. But if you, know, if you have prostate cancer, it's not just a okay. yeah, it's, that's not the intention of the program. Yeah.